the kind of key issue that drove me into neuroeconomics was uh, something I'd found in the late 1990s that trust at the level of a country was the big gun to explain why countries are rich or poor. So economists have for 50 years or more looked for the factors that cause a country to grow and become prosperous or those factors are missing and uh, countries mired in poverty. And trust really was this huge factor. Um, high trust countries are by and large rich countries or certainly fast growing countries and poor countries are countries with low trust. And the variation of this data is substantial. So the last data I saw, 2% of Brazilians said they trust each other. Whereas in the United States, around 45% of Americans trust each other and two thirds of Norwegians trust each other. So we characterized why trust would be higher or low across different environments. And the payoff to raising trust, which can be done through public policy, uh, is substantial in terms of improving people's lives. Countries in which trust is high have effective governments, they have um, very tight social structures, people interact very nicely with each other, they don't have a lot of divisions, um, and there's a positive feedback loop. They have higher incomes, which further accentuates greater growth. So trust is this kind of great summary measure of uh, a society in which things are working well. And lack of trust, therefore, is a measure of how things do not work well in society. So there's kind of an upside and a downside to this cross-country trust worth. One is that we find that there is a threshold level of trust in other people below which you get very little growth at all. And that threshold depends on the environment of that country uh, being in. But if trust is too low, it's just too hard to engage in transactions. There's too many what economists call transaction costs. I need lawyers and uh, judges and uh, the cops who enforce all these agreements. And so therefore, the the number of people I interact with economically becomes very small. I only interact with my family or my clan or someone who's really trusted because I can't count on the government to enforce these contracts. That limits the size of the market and therefore the number of transactions that can occur that uh, increase prosperity. So for developing countries this is particularly critical that you need to have solid institutions that will facilitate economic transactions. So trust, for example, in China is quite high. China has a very effective government. Even though it's authoritarian, it's market-oriented. In other work I've done, we've shown that with sufficient growth, all authoritarian governments eventually become democracies. So um, personally, I'm less concerned with China as an authoritarian system, although I think the human rights abuses are horrendous. Uh, that will resolve itself as economic growth proceeds because it moves power away from the center and towards the individual. Right? When individuals have economic power, they can press the government to be better. And so I think that's the way to make progress in developing countries. Um, in other developing countries, largely in Sub-Saharan Africa and some in South America, you see trust levels that are so low that you see no or little economic growth. And so in some of these countries, um, Haiti comes to mind, Venezuela, uh, you have such corrupt governments that there's no reason to even undertake transactions. You do what you need to eat, and then most of the money flows out of that country into the United States or into the West where the money is safer. So that's a huge problem, and I think the way to solve that is not necessarily internally. It may require international focus on improving institutions in these countries. So the World Bank has a program that has done some work in this area, but it's awfully hard to move a country uh, that has very poor institutions into one that's got very good institutions absent something catastrophic. So the alternative approach is to start from the ground up. So things like microfinance and microentrepreneurship are a way to uh, take economic power and bring it back to the individuals, even at the lowest levels, um, weaving cloth, um, making pottery. And the way to do this now is, I think, through the internet, where you can have collectives that sell uh, to some place that gets this to a larger market and that allows uh, small farmers, small weavers, these individuals to actually earn a living that doesn't depend or isn't even outside of the purview of a corrupt government. And as they do that, they build this groundswell of support for better institutions because they have enough capacity to do that. So if your belly is empty, you're worried more about getting enough calories on board than about whether your government is inflating the currency. But once you actually have some economic base, then there can be a role for uh, ground-level change in governments. 
And I think this is one reason why the United States uh, had these brilliant framers, but they decentralized power. And so there's a constant feedback between keeping power from centralizing in the United States and allowing it to disperse, which creates better government. Mm -hmm.